Fro, Fro, um, Frothe Alessand come over all the way from Iceland to, to do a talk on Iceland today. Um, I'm not going to steal thunder and thunder, but one thing that having fished and spent a lot of time in Iceland, the, the attitude from their government to work with their fishers, as I said earlier, has worked extremely well, and, 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 and Frothe has run a hatchery system um, on a river which is was taken out quite badly um, due to hydro a number of years ago and has shown that this can work um, in a number of things. So I'll, I'll let him go, it's really great that he's come to do this for us today, so we can see how this actually works. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's a little bit warmer here than in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more cold to warm us up as well. Uh, my name is Röster Lindersson. I've been involved with stocking for 40 years in the different rivers around Iceland. I'm going to make a, a lecture uh, here, a presentation about what I've been doing, not just this one river, uh, yet the latest one, but also whatever I've, I've been doing in the last 40 years or so. Uh, I'm educated in agriculture, fish biology, and I've been, uh, been uh, lucky to work with my passion and uh, build up a company called Strengi. Uh, which is uh, a license, uh, a licensee with, uh, where we uh, offer fishing around Iceland in different rivers, salmon and trout fishing. And uh, we have, uh, what shall we say, we have been uh, uh, 30 full time for 32 years. Uh, but I've been stopping for 40 years. I will a uh, little bit. Uh, Talk about general about things, uh, what are we doing in Iceland and what we are doing in Iceland. But of course, mainly on the stocking, but of course, it's been catch and release, trout, and uh, <laughs> habitat improvement, fish ladders. Fish ladder is a big thing in Iceland. We have hundreds of kilometers of new areas uh, uh, in our rivers in Iceland where we get the run up or, or we do a par or fry releasing uh, before we open it for the fish ladders. And, uh, that's a big thing in Iceland as well. But stocking is also, stocking is not quite, as we say, a popular thing. We can say in Iceland there is about 100 salmon rivers in Iceland. And uh, stocking is done in relatively few of them. It used to be a little bit more, uh, but uh, still those that are uh, doing it in are doing pretty well. Well, a little bit explain Iceland, middle of Atlantic <coughs> Ocean. We are on the edge of the warm Gold Stream, which you see as the red one, and uh, the, the East Greenland current coming from the north, which is the polar current, very, very cold, and they two meet just north of Iceland. And these goals, this current, this, uh, this sea te temperatures and, and the situation conditions in the sea have a lot of effect on re our return rates. For example, uh, rivers. In the south and the west, the average sea temperatures uh, are around in June, July, when the smokes are going in, uh, they are around 10, 12 degrees, while in the, in the north and the east, especially here, they can be all down to 5, 6, 7, 8 degrees, so it's a much harsh conditions. And the stocks of, in Iceland are very much like the north and the east, are more like mixed Tushi winter stocks and grids. While we have the stocks in the south and the west coast of Iceland, that I would say 90 percent are grids in Iceland. And where do our salmon go? As we don't know all where they will go, but uh, there are indications that at least the grids are going far south, uh, uh, southwest of Iceland, 200 miles or even more further down, and the indication that they are there, plus the, the north and east. I go further east like this up here, but they, as I said, we don't know exactly all where they go, but at least they are going to the feeding grounds shorter way than the Scottish or the English sound. Uh, that's for sure. Live circus, uh, just to uh, show you how that is, as everybody knows, it is fry, you see, sorry, it's an X, Yorkshire fry, fry, par, smots, grills, and, and then bigger salmon, and then come back to, to spawn. And of course, every salmon that is coming to the river, every salmon need to spawn. He's coming to the rivers to spawn. 
And if someone tell you that stock, small stock fish are, are, are cannot uh, reproduce, that's, that's a failure. They, they taste, all fish are coming back to spawn. That's, that's, that's the key of thing. Well, whether they were raised in naturally whatever is the life, the life cycle. Okay, I'm going to start with my uh, first experiment, 1984. There's a small river north of Reykjavik, half an hour north of Reykjavik, close to Laksham Coast, called Kirafelsa. I started uh, a small uh, experiment program there in 1984. Tiny little river, and uh, that, uh, we had some problem to let the salmon come in, so we made a small trap here, just above the estuary, so the kids could go through, and when they went through, they couldn't go back again. So they, they went up the river, and we had a small pond, this is a very small one, we have normally a bigger one, but once I only released 1,000 smalls in 1984, and we had 70 grills the following year. It's a 7% return rate to the rocks. We talk in Iceland to the return to the rod, and the rod means what the fisherman is caught catching. And 7% is the highest uh, heard anywhere in the world on the, on the rod. And uh, so these are also these years that, uh, that were the return of the JC <coughs> was much higher than, than it is today. And I will go further into that. But uh, after that, I started to be involved with uh, the Ramco rivers along with the local hunting club and some landowners and uh, we put this uh, small uh, uh, releasing experience more into action there. I was mainly on the west but I was also partly in the east the first years as well, managing the fishing and doing uh, small releasing along with, with the local hunting club and, and some landowners as well. So these were, these were 10 year period, 11 year period I was involved. Small ponds, it's a waste of time and money to release small into river without putting it into a small releasing pond first. It has to be go into, of course, make the smaltification process in the pond. We should get them into the pond as a par, a big par in, in, in late, late spring. Everything is different timing a little bit there than here. So we are putting them in the ponds in May, June. And uh, maybe one month there, or, or, or longer or less, depends on the smortification process, which depends on the temperature in the pond. In the West Ranga, which uh, at, uh, at uh, relatively cold rivers, we need to get the temperature as high as possible. It also, uh, uh, preferably about 10 degrees Celsius, but uh, it, it, it's cold. If you have a cold water, you don't get the smortification process properly going through that, and they might not get, get the whole process through to get out. It, it, it can happen. You have to, you have to get the temperature. This is a little experiment I did with the Institute of Freshwater Fisheries in the Ranka in the old days, which is give us a little bit how we can control where we catch our fish from the most releasing ponds. And this is uh, <coughs> distance from place or release. That means that here the pond is here. Uh, this is above the pond, and this is below the pond. And the dark, the dark ones are uh, release ponds on tributary brooks. Tiny, it only need to be some tiny little brooks. If you have a small pond in a tributary brook, the fish will not go much higher up. They will go straight there and even lay there in, in a halting place without, and if it, it's not even a halting place or whatever, but if it is like to be, there's home water, they will stay there, they will be close to the, to the, to the most recent part. And this way you can control, you have a beat that has no, that has no uh, a very slow fishing or very, very little fishing of all the fish are running through, you put a pond in a small tributary there, bingo, you get the fish to stop there right away. And even, we had it, what should we say, the year that we start the programs, because there is a smell or something from the pond, it disturbs the run, and even the fish start to lay that the year you start the operation of pond in that period. We had some experience with that. And, uh, and then we also have the release ponds in the main river, just the, the water from the river itself in the channel, and we put a pond, and, uh, and, uh, 
And then the spreading is much more. I know it also depends on what kind of river it is, if it's a lot of waterfalls on the way of the spread, but they can they can be everywhere more or less. They can go higher up. But of course they are a little bit concentrated still in the air, but nothing like the trip to uh, Here we have the upper waterfall in West Rongo. Uh, this boat I'm showing because of two reasons. First to show this. <coughs> These are grills. Here's a big me that means and there's a two zoom interface. That means that when you're using the big smalls, we're talking about I think it was almost small releasing up to I think 50 to 100 grams, which is big small, as small still, because of the hot water we can boost the, the growth in the hatchery. Um, the the fish go to the sea with the uh, advantage of the size and fat, and they come back bigger. Also bigger grills and bigger two shoe interface. If you if they're going out, you're going to be big. And the biggest grills ever we had was a micro tag uh, fish. We did some experiments with micro tag to get full information on where the fish are going from the palms and what kind of small sort of best. That uh, that the biggest one was uh, released uh, and came in the year after 5.5 kilos. In one year. Is that all? So it must have been relevant, but it's bigger than that, but that was unique. The other reason I'm showing this waterfall is called the upper waterfall. There is a fish ladder there, I don't have a photo of it, and uh, there was a fish counter there. Hmm. One season, uh, I had a small producing pond. Uh, there's a fishing beat about, about, I think it's about 25 miles all the way up to the mountain. And I had a pond in a small tributary there, one, one year. And uh, we saw that in the beginning of July, the season was just starting, that there was a, five fish had gone through the fish ladder. And the beat is 25 miles, or 25 kilometers, uh, 20 miles, sorry. And I told the first fish when we bought a license, oh, oh there's, there are five fish up there, only 25 miles to find them. But <laughs> I told them to go to this spot, just to a pool just below there below the, the creek by the pond, and it took two of the five. <laughs> I also had on the fish counter there over 200 fish going through the fish counter and going up, spreading them somewhere up there. We hardly had any of them, just lost them. So it's just not a question about getting the fish back. You have, to, you have to harvest, you have to find the fish which you're getting. You just, uh, you know, it's, it's just it's a big river, big river system. And the, the trip to the brooks makes you so pinpoint, bingo. You can get back your catch back your face. Well, we carry on. <laughs> this is uh, Ranga. These are the total cast east and west Ranga, the first <coughs> yes. Uh, it was most of it was in the west at that time. The, this is the total cats. The average cats before it, the program was about fifty salmon, plus a good number of sea trout and things like that. And this is all just small to reason. The, fish, the, the numbers up and down is that uh, here is the, was a 48,000 small to release 89 and got 2.7% return rate to the rod, which was fairly good. And then the, spin up, the numbers have increased every year and now I think in the east and the west and east Rongo, total is a million small or more released a year, the whole river system. This is, uh, I was not involved after 2001. But this was a, a <coughs> big adventure, and uh, see that this can be done. I will uh, carry on. Uh, after 2001, I moved to my favorite river, uh, where I caught my first salmon as a young boy, Breitarsal, on the east coast of Iceland. Totally different kind of river. It is, had a Small, has a small limited stock, 50 to 100 salmon a year. It has, uh, but also because of the sea conditions, the, 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 the catches in, in uh, Pretasa <coughs> prior to the small program started was, can be very much up and down. For example, Iceland 1978 was a, one of the record year all over Iceland, I think all over the Atlantic Ocean. We, we had in Pretasa 400 salmon. 1978. 1984 was a very bad year all over Iceland. A very bad year. Plato shot four salmon. So it was 100 times up and down. And this is the 
Well, I uh, started small program there, just, uh, just, just before, and, and put full force on, on, on putting out a good number of smalls, uh, and got the uh, and took a blue stock, of course, from that river. Plus, I got a permission down those years to take also party from other East Coast rivers, <coughs> from blue stock fish as well. Uh, today, regulations do not allow it. This was, as I said, this is a long time ago. And of course, we are always using the blue stock from each river uh, for, for our program. So, this is, uh, these were the good years also in Iceland, generally. Year 2000, and also, fair enough, 2008, 2000, and up to 2011 was a, well, were a fantastic year in Iceland, even record year in some of the rivers. And this is what <coughs> we have we have net to protect from birds, we have fish feeders, we feed them by the boat automatically, and then also by hand twice a day. We try to stress the lot of sunshine, so we put extra net also sometimes over it, so we are a bit more. Uh, more uh, um, and, uh, and they system. And uh, we also we transfer them into the ponds uh, by the trucks. And here you can look into the one of the tank. It's not like a small, it looks more like a power. So they come and not, well, it's the same fish that are just they haven't had what should I say? This multiplication process hasn't started. It's it's uh, it's been a little bit dark in the hatchery, and they, or, or they've been keeping dark. And then they go out in the light, and they get the, the, the spring, they get the light, and they will, and they get the temperature in the pond, and they will get this multiplicated. But this will not be good in a cold pond. So it has to be. A, a, you cannot put them, put them like that. You need to have them like you see here. Is a partly we could yeah, we could say this a pre small. So it's time, just the process little bit started. You know, just about to start to get silver and a little bit silver. That will be the best thing. And even more silver if they are going into a cold pond. Uh, but it also, this uh, pond I showed to you is in a, in, a, in, a, in a creek in this corner here, you can see it. And, and just to show you what, how much the pond can change fishing in a beat, is just like here. This is the, 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 the pool you saw there, is, uh, the pond is, 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 is here. And everything here, it was nothing, these original years. Yet later on, hundreds and hundreds of salmon are caught in the pools just around. Not this small creek, but uh, it just changed from one or two fish to hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of fish, just like that. And uh, the pond is here, and this area here is catching maybe six, eight hundred fish. <laughs> so the pond is put into the fill action. There's the lots in the background. In Bredarsa, there's a waterfall in the what should we say, a little bit above the middle part of the river. And uh, there's a fish ladder there, and we did for a while I have a fish counter there. And that gave us a little bit of information, uh, like how much, how many fish were catching uh, out of the run. There, the fish are only coming up in the upper part there, it may be in August. We are fishing like July, sorry, July, August, September, three months. And, so it's a late, late, later part of the season we're fishing up, uh, up the upper part there, and mainly in September. And by, by the camping, we were catching maybe 25-30% of the run, which go into the upper part. So, but we're catching below it, it's probably higher. So, generally in Iceland, and uh, which is a little bit special, it is, I don't know why, but there is a... The cats, we are catching about... 50%, we often say, you catch about half of the run in Icelandic groups. I think in Scotland it's 10% or maybe less. I understand. I, mean, I don't know the reason for this. Some Iceland, many Icelandic groups are small, they are short season. The, 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 I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's fished heavily when, in this short season, but uh, I, I, I cannot explain why it's not 10% or whatever. In some rivers of Iceland, it might even be much higher. We have seen some. They caught 80, 70, 80 percent of the run has been caught. But now most of it's catch and release. And, uh, and uh, generally we have not overfished Icelandic River, that's my opinion. It's, it's not like that. Even in the, in the past, we're killing everything. Except we could clearly see that, 
Uh, the early phase, which we had two human interface very much in Iceland, they were getting less and less as everywhere else. And part of that region, we, they were long, much longer time under, under fishing pressure, we were killing them more and more out of the circle. So, so there was more, more grid spawning instead of two human interface, so slowly there was... This has been changed and we get uh, the feeling that generally in Iceland, we are getting it slowly back to two human interface. We are getting more of big fish in Iceland. I think that it's taking, it will take some time, but we, we have the feeling that it's, it's, it's happening. And it's proven genetically that two human interface parents give more right of two human interface. And instead of just two grills or grills or two human interface uh, put together. Hatchery, I had a small hatchery up in Bredalsau, but also I deal with a big hatchery north in the big Laxau. Uh, in Iceland, all small S1, more or less. We have the hot water normally in most hatcheries in Iceland, enough of it. So we, we, we push them high, right as they start feeding, 10, 12 degrees, and all the way to, uh, from, from February to, to fall or to Christmas. And then we put them outside into cold and the dark and all control it by a photo period inside the hatchery and get them so they get winter into their lights. And then uh, we can control the light, how much light they get as the spring comes, and we control the heat so we can control the, the status of them when we move them into the ponds. If they are, how much we want to be doing them. In a cold pond you would maybe let them be a little bit more smartificated or, or in a hot pond you can just be like a, like a park. But we can, we can control these factors in the hatchery. Here is, uh, we did some, uh, both in Bredoso and also in Ramco, did with the Jokla as well, we did some micro tag that we put a tag in the nose. And as I, as I told you, that, uh, that, and then we record, we record the fish, how good, how, how the size of the fish, how it looks, and in what pond he went, and when he was released. And, this, this is, and then we cut, of course, the other post to indicate it has a micro tag in the nose. This is very expensive, it costs about the same as, 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 as the cost of smalls. The cost of smalls, well, it's up and down, but just to say something, it's around one quid per, per, per small. I could say on, on average, mm -hmm. with the small releasing process, making a pound feed or whatever. It can be less, it can be more, but just to say something. Here we have the micro tag in smalls in, in, in Breda, so. And uh, well, I'm showing this photo a little bit because of a little bit special. This is uh, this man on the right, this, this biologist friend of mine who was micro tagging them. Uh, and we had a fish caught from Bretal, so 200 miles southwest of Iceland, uh, by some fishermen. Uh, uh, he found the, found the salmon around the court or whatever, took the fish, put it to the Institute of Fish Water Fisheries because it was at the post with much cut. They did read it and they saw it was from Bretos so on this point, was this size, so had been released that place, had been marked here, had been raised up in Hatchet in the north. And uh, why I'm saying this is that because this man, the Hatchery manager in the north, of the, which was raising the fish, and the fishermen were all in the same class in the school. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, the fish came in their lives and 200 nautical miles southwest of Iceland. <laughs> so, this is a small story. <laughs> Here you see a thing has been cut on this fish here. And, uh, but we don't do it hardly anymore, really. But it's, it's costly. Here you see a blue stock fishing in Bredal Sau. This is a little bit special. Uh, these are two big ones after this thing has the season. One of them is micro tag with adipose fin, he said, and the other one was wild. And uh, the other one, we took some very big fish out of the beta, so we had some of the biggest fish in Iceland caught some years in my program. We put a lot of pressure on them, and we made a big fish, and we choose them over the season, but you them into the boxes. And uh, there was one surprise in Breta, so which, uh, which is a little bit different than any other river of Iceland. Breta is also on the east side of Iceland, far from any other river of, in, in Iceland, more or less, that they, they were they, we could read in the scale samples that there were a few freezer winter fish coming. And that's never, hardly ever seen in Iceland. There were not many, and there were uh, 20, 10 kilos plus, males and females, both from the wild stock and from the blue stock program, from the small program. I think it's maybe six or seven of them. But they said, uh, 
És úgy tudom, ezt a főzőtől tőlem, de erre előtt a friss jövőt tőlem. Somebody turns this, coming back again. But most big face in Iceland, we call it big, you know, the very big face, 10 kilo plus, are just two shim interface. Even there, they are there, just going past some of them. Many, many. Uh, what's happening here? This is East Iceland. Data from the Institute of Asphalt Fisheries. The average cat is the this line here. So then, the cats is per year. And as I told you, it was a fantastic year in Britain, so we're catching fish, fish. This year when I'm splitting it up, and these are the catches in East Iceland. Uh, after that, after 2011, generally the catches went down in Iceland seriously. Still good, but it went down compared to the record years we had from from as you see from 90, 90 you know from 1992 to 2000 and 2011 was one of the best we've had for many years. And uh, <coughs> the reason why suddenly the return rate from the sea went down seriously, or some, this is difficult to say why, and at the same time, uh, cost-wise, I had to reduce my numbers of small, so bread also went down again. It was a mixture of that, plus I had, uh, the cost-wise, uh, I thought also we might get some real sales to prove, have it self-sustainable, the river, by a lot of spawning, or fish. But it didn't turn out. The, the, the habitat at the bottom is a little bit too bad. But, uh, but financially, I, I'd have to reduce uh, the spot to listen. And uh, here you can see uh, in the period of uh, 1997 to 2022, they have been released about 2.2 million smoths, and also a little bit power as well, not many. And we had about 11,100 salmon back up. So it's 0.3%, uh, 0. 0.2 uh, to the, to the rod. Uh, it was expected, the rod cats on northeast part of Iceland was expected about 0.5% to the rod. There is always lower return rate in the north and east because of the sea conditions, also genetically, because there are some two-ship interface there. And, uh, and when you have two sheep in the face, you have also higher mortality in the sea. It's an extra year in the sea, it means extra mortality. And if you are aiming to build a big stock, you're also aiming to sacrifice quantity for quality. So, uh, so that's also part of this. Uh, and here I also want to explain to you this thing from a satellite. Gold stream, this is East Iceland. Gold stream is coming, as I explained it earlier, up to Iceland, coming up to the south coast. It goes west and, run, and, and up north and then east again, but very weak. And then it, it sometimes doesn't get all the way better, so it's here, where the warm cold sea doesn't really sometimes don't fix it. So it's a little bit high, higher mortality even there in this part. Also, generally, in northeast of Iceland, it can be very much as a up and down because of this less stability, like in the, the warm sea south of Iceland. So, same time, I built a very nice lot, so I'm saying one of the finest lots in Iceland. Uh, but uh, at the end of the line, it was, uh, it was a little bit tough to have such a low return rate for a while. For all the investments, but I, just, I, I want to explain also. And uh, there's a small river south from Breta, so it's a town called Hub. I had that river for a while, and I was running a small program on it. it. It just didn't have sustainable stock, and we did a pond there. And uh, I'll show you here where it is. Uh, here, here is Breta, so here is this Laxalvinia ship, this river here. I had uh, uh, same smoths. Putting into this river here, just a few, not, uh, not a huge number, but very few numbers, and uh, into ponds here, and then the same small thing here, from the same truck, from the same time, from the hatchery and everything, the return rate here was 0.5%, but of course, uh, much of it was uh, partly as a two-ship interface, came a year later. Here, most of the fish came after one year, <coughs> as a big grids, and, it, and they were in this. This, uh, this is a higher temperature, and the return rate to the rod was 2.7%. <laughs> Total the same price, but uh, it's seven times difference in the return rate. And the only difference is the sea temperature. And 
conditions. But uh, uh, this is what I uh, sorry, as I was saying, Brett and so I just had, had fun to, to kick off, I would like to kick off with a huge uh, motor leasing again, and, 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 uh, and it, it's such a beautiful place, it doesn't need a lot of sun, it just to keep people happy and with all the big fish there, and, and there's a new operator, and uh, I uh, have been uh, in co good cooperation with, the, with them, and, uh, and uh, wish them all the luck, and uh, I'm sure if they put an effort to work into it, they can build up Brett or so again, as I did, but I... I moved all my resources into the next river system, Jökla River, in the northeast. What a beautiful river, as you see. But uh, this is a photo of Jökla, as it was before a huge stand was built at the top of the river system. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, before 2007, it was the most dirtiest river of Iceland. Glacier River, just full of mud. And there's just, there's just nothing there. There are some tributaries at the bottom part of it, which have a little bit, I will explain also, a little bit of salmon, few salmon, and then plus sea trout, and trout, and, and, and after char. Here you see the same place after the dam came. You go, 20 cubic meters. Big time. It's in. Hallelujah. Yeah. And suddenly there was just this, this, uh, River is the longest river of Iceland, 120 kilometers. Suddenly it started to be clean. Oops. And the landowners uh, contacted me, wanted me to advise what to do with this river. And I said, Ruth, oh, it's too big for anyone to do anything. <laughs> then I, I went and had a look at it. I went to fish the tributaries a little bit. And I had a bonanza, I had a salmon, I had a chow, natural land. And, and uh, this was, so I decided to, to, to take the whole river system under my, under my wing, with the tributaries and everything. And uh, that's been a new adventure, a little bit, if I try to explain here. Here is uh, the biggest glacier of, of, of Europe, like yogurt. Here you can see a lake. This is, the, <coughs> this is the lake from the dam, which is here. The river is flowing down here, 120 kilometers to the sea. Uh, they make a dam here, close the river for a power uh, supply to a power station which is at the bottom of this lake and they make an underground tunnel 40 miles to move one of the cubic meters of water into that power plant. It's one of the biggest dam projects in Europe. Small version of the three dam project in China. And will never be allowed today. And uh, now the glacier water is moving into this lake and down here. And then it comes together with the Yakla at the estuary again. Uh, so it's like uh, the change to go down here, you go down this way, under the underground, and then you see. So suddenly, it was, and there you can see at the bottom here is uh, Yakla coming down, and uh, from the big lake all the way, and they meet again down in the estuary. And there's a small tributary I have also in this way here. As I'm moving a whole river system. Here is the, the dam. It's a huge one. And this is taken late in the season, late in the, in the or before, overflow, the dam is full, and the overflow is coming over, and uh, we cannot fish the aqua itself when this happened. But before that, the dam is, is down, it's, they're using the dam for the production, and it goes into underground, under this mountain, for two miles, to the power station. So, uh, so it's all, and this overflow is coming in late, late August normally, and then, then it's finished in September before the salmon spawns. The salmon are spawning in the river after the overflow is finished, so everything is it matches perfectly. Uh, it will be overflow and it will be spawning, and then it goes down, all the ice will be ruined. Here you can a little bit explain a little bit the dam. This is the red line, is the, when the overflow is coming over the dam, this is the level of the dam, and this is Status now is very low. The average is the green one. It's late, late August that it comes over, over, flip over the dam. Has happened in early August, like last year. Very bad. We had it in the beginning of August, but the average is late August. And also, but now it's so low, we think it might even happen in September and maybe not at all. Because it's been so cold in Iceland. That's why I came up. <laughs> but, uh, so this explains, and you fall, I, I look at this card every, 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 it's, it's, it's on the back, you can look at this card from the power company. 
Here you see the temperature of the of the Yacht Club. It's one of the warmest rivers of Iceland, really. It's part of the of the first creeks, the first water comes into it just from here, from the heat sources. So the river is warmer, the higher it goes up, but you see it goes all the way up to 20, 25 degrees on the hot days. But then it collapsed here. It's, it's 2021 because the overflow is coming in and the, the temperature collapsed as soon as the overflow comes It's a glacier water. <coughs> uh, before that, it, it's, it's, uh, we didn't know this. When I started the Earth Club, we didn't know nothing what was going to happen, what was going to do. I just took the chance. As usual. And it's warm, it can be warm in East Iceland, the south wind, and 29 degrees the warmest days I've had in the, in the river. So it can get warm in Iceland. Well, I'm just going to explain a little bit what, what this has meant uh, uh, for, for the stock in the river. This is a Laxa. This is a small tribute in the lower part of the Earth Club. By the name of said, they had a few fish, natural fish, uh, uh, in, in this tributary. And I managed to take a few of them, uh, take some of them for the food stock when I started the program, but also got a special permission to use Breton salt stock as well uh, to start the, the stocking program of, of the river. It was nothing there except there is few fish in the tributaries. So, small river, Laksa, but this is a pond. In this river, it's a small river, only at two kilometers, and it turned out that the habitat is pretty good. And after I started the the, the small program, the fish are spawning there, and suddenly these are the wild hard count for that tributary, so they are coming up following my small program. That's my tributary. We carry on. Oh, this sorry, this is and uh, one of the biggest salmon ever. This is called last fall encounter. But the biggest salmon ever, I think, in 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 in, in New York, I was caught also in this tributary, uh, 107 centimeters, 25 pounds, but in the closing place one. Also, these are females, big ones. These are big fish in New York. Normally, the rate is about 50-50 big fish and, and two shipping the fish and the grills. But it can be different between years. It used to be more gorgeous in the early years, but I, I explained why later. I just had to show this pool just because William is here. He, uh, this is a pool that uh, we have a problem in Yakla. There are too many pools, and I haven't, I haven't had enough fishermen to visit. <laughs> uh, there are about 30 kilometers of the one of the 20 kilometers I haven't seen yet. So, and uh, I haven't seen some of the pools that have been fished. So I cannot be everywhere. So, and I uh, did send William down to this canyon. This, this, is, this is just below the mineral, this pool, but never been fished. But I tried to fish it 15 years ago, and then there was nothing. And I was planning to go there one morning, and I, and I was just about to go into the canyon, and I had to go off, and I said, William, please go and check on this pool for me. And how many did you have? Landed four, lost two, removed another four in two hours. <laughs> so, and we're going to open them, and then this photo is taken, day after, the overflow is coming, and this, the river is starting to be unfishable. So we're waiting for opening now in 24th of June to start fishing this pool again. It's only been fished for one day in history. <laughs> Okay, this is another thing. What's happening? You have to disappear under the ground. We didn't know that until they uh, put the, the dam down and the river disappeared. Disappear under the ground. This is incredible. Here comes Yakla down, rushing down, disappearing and coming up under high pressure under this, all this rocky area. This is a unique natural phenomenon. And suddenly, oops, it cannot. It is coming up, boiling up like a, like a pot and high pressure. Here it's coming down up there and suddenly boil up down And it happened once, I remember, you saw this, that there came high, high water in the mid-season and, uh, and this got flooded and we started to catch fish above. There was only one, but this was a major problem. Suddenly out of the blue we could not fish the middle and the upper part of the river because of these stones we didn't know about before the dam. So we started to make a, a, fish, a fish pile, a fish channel just beside it. And started to fish uh, above and we opened it, it. And right away, in one hour, I think hundreds of salmon were gone up. <laughs> and fantastic pools. This was 2012. And into a pool. This is the same pool. Uh, I saw the photo of uh, the water river was so high and then it was so low in the first photos of the earth. But this is the pool now. This is now one of the best pools of the river. We just started to fish it regularly four years ago, so it is discovered. I just have to tell you some fishing stories here because this guy here is 
very happy and he was very happy this afternoon because this afternoon he had uh, he had five or six salmon on one rod. The smallest was 82 and the biggest was 92. This is and Iceland is not famous for big fish. This uh, he has put three years up. So. This is and then we took this photo here. The river is crystal clean. We opened the day officially 4th of July 2007. Just ourselves and some friends, we ran up and down the river, it was just a bit beautiful, not alive, nothing, just terrible. Uh, except we saw a few fish around the tributaries in the bottom part, you know, they were, they were, that's the new they could be. So it's just starting with that, I and mean, all these pools are now full of fish. And then suddenly we discovered after we had made the disturbance, there was a, another problem. The, in the canyon inside, behind the, the fishermen, there was a small waterfall, which he thought it should be able to go through, but out of the blue, he couldn't. He had difficulty to go up uh, that water. He did, but he had difficulty to do it. And, uh, and then, I'm not sure if you're going to get the video, the first one, I'm not sure if I should show it. Yeah. Okay, this is a video, so I'll press on it somehow. I think you go out for the So I maybe shouldn't sh show this, but uh, how do I start again? If you click it again, it should start. Okay. And then we, we went in for we went in for the force and to the waterfall. We'll get some bleak in it. I was fishing just below. And there you see, this is what we blowed up. It can make this channel here. And an hour later, see what happened then. If you put it up again. This is just taken one hour later.
Oh, there you go, sorry. This small tributary also, out of, I stopped this water releasing and now it's just while power count is coming up naturally. Out of the blue, just there you go. I don't need to put anything in it anymore. Mm. This, this small tributary, yeah. The lower tributary is a pool, long pool, a lot of stones, and one of the, these are now some of the most protected places, so this is an upper of your club. And, uh, and just uh, to see, I mean, all these are good habitat, just to see. You know, the river is warm, the river is high density, it's fertile, and there's a, this is the perfect bottom for, for the power and fingering to survive. And this is what I didn't know before we started, that it, it will be so good. So, I luckily, early on, was not sure what to do, I put on power up and down the valley as well into these areas, before they before the made the channel uh, visible up. So, that's why the fish went so straight up after we opened the channel. They, they, they had been released as a power. And then we, we run around, we spread them around, we see them and we go into the, into the uh, bottom here. Uh, and it's important to, you know, to, to not put them in one place, to spread them as, as possible. And now this is a very important, this is the power count in Yepla itself. Yellow. These are my power fingerlings I've been I'm putting out, but they find in the park. Huh? These are 0 plus, 1 plus, 3 plus, 2 plus, wild power. And they say, group, <coughs> they're taking over. And I will reduce now the power and not stop it totally because there's so many areas that there's not still spawning in, it's really so big, that uh, I will uh, that I will reduce it and put it more into small. This is a Jeremy, I just, uh, with your permission, I decided to... He explained it a little bit, if you can put up the, the, in the next one, the video. Uh, very well. <laughs> and, uh, if you can put it, up, put it on the next one. Okay. Discovering and William, you can see here. 
more and more. We take blue stock fish as well when we are when we are fishing late season and uh, in the last time. Here I'm explaining just a little bit the whole what I've been doing and the part as you can see uh, I've been building up 700. 45,000 small since I began 2006, really. This is a small experiment first, and about, uh, and about power in England is about, uh, about 800, 900,000 up and down. I expect we have had about 0.3% return rate to the rot of these fishes. And uh, also we go more into studies. This is higher up the river. This is one of the most Beautiful place, it's a nice and famous tourist place, and the rumors there fish I've seen out there. I was going out to look for fish. It's a little bit spectacular. <laughs> and now, another place is we can drive up the valley and see it from distance down to the river. Pools here and there which never been fished. All the way up in the highlands. Here is a little bit special. Here we are electricity and conductivity of the water. In Iceland, we don't have the same problem as you with, with the, 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 what should we say, pollution, too much chemical, too much phosphor, and things like that. And on the opposite, we are, our rivers are too sterile, they're too clean, many of them. It's too, they need more nutrition, we need more, you know, we need more, <laughs> it's more like that. This is a little bit, uh, uh, nutrition conductivity, and uh, it's good when you have it above 60, 70, and up to 100 or more. And some rivers of Iceland are, are pretty low. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, and they are more like for the Arctic char and things like that. And uh, even you just look at Cielo and Hossa. Cielo is more, more, uh, is more less conductivity. Hossa has it more. But uh, you can see that some of these rivers in Iceland, they have, they are, they have low, uh, low uh, conductivity. Jökla, on the other hand, is very high. 92 up to 158 is one of the highest, and the river system is huge compared to most of the rivers so in Iceland. So just just to show you a little bit about how it is. Here are the statistics of Yatra Kassin. Yatra from the beginning, zero, and then up from 2007, and we go up. And why does it go up and down? That's because when the overflow comes and disturbs the fishing. Except to begin with, all the fishing here was tributaries, more or less the beginning. It was nothing in there, it was just tributaries. You will see later on. Here, is, here we only could face uh, the beginning of August, otherwise we would be problem up here. This year, for only year we could face three months, full season, and uh, 870 salmon, but for a very few fishermen, only about uh, six to eight rods with a 20 pounds and cooking on it. It was a very little pressure. And we didn't know half of the pools we know today. And this is still, these are the figures for East Iceland these years with Jökla inside it. So if Jökla would have been, this would have been even lower, this, this downfall in the East Island. Here you can see the difference in Jökla, salmon fishing, how it has gone up in blue, and the trout fishing, the char fishing. It's mainly char, and it's some trout as well. How that is going up and down, it's not really going down, but it's, it's, it's uh, and it's important, we, we try to keep the trout and the child and the, the summer tributaries down there. I mean, asking now people to catch and release quite a lot of them. This is just to see how good you have to can be out of the blue. It had nothing. These are the week 19th of July, the 26th of July last year. The status for best rivers of Iceland that week. And we had 180, sorry, we had uh, 137 salmon for the 8 rods, 2.4 salmon per rod per day. Only Austin, Austin, Sela, which was some of the best in Iceland, are higher. Most of the rivers are far below, just this week. Just to show the, the, how the quality from zero is coming up. It's one of the best rivers of Iceland today. This is the size of the fish. The blue is the, uh, is the grills. Medium sized fish, you know, and then the uh, big ones, uh, well, uh, 10 pounders and then up to 87, and then two of the big ones at the top. It's just mainly great to begin with. Also, we are starting the program. It's just, you know, automatically we are getting more and more big fish as, as, as things develop. And you get a bigger run every year, bigger run every year, and that comes kicking in. And, uh, and, and, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good size. You see, big, big fish, fantastic conditions. Big fish is a 90 centimeter plus fish up to 102, 21. 
this is not normal for Iceland, this is, this is, this is famous for many for British history. Here you can see a little bit special. The red one is the tributaries, cats per year, uh, as a percentage, and the year flights, as we say, that it was just the first year was just a tributary, small program. Slowly it's less and less, I reduced the smalls, increased with power instead here. But now, since the natural, natural stock is taken over, I will reduce the power and increase the small to, to ensure this in, after overflow in the tributaries. Okay, building a lot, it's all investments that have been done. I, uh, uh, I don't get any fund from government or anything else. I just build a lot, make a program, and rent, pay a rent to rivers, everything. It's a, it's a risky business, but, uh, but I, you know, something else. I love to do my passion, and uh, normally it has worked, but of course it's... it's if, I, if Yacht Club would not have been self-sustainable itself, I think this would have probably been an impossible task financially. The pay rent, there's a lot, without smalls and power every year, smalls every year, it could have been. And so, this is what we're doing. All the assets need to be there, also champagne, sauna, fireplace, everything. Just beside the Yacht Club, the, the, the lots in Yatla is a big river called Kaltar, which means cold river. And uh, it's not so sustainable for salmon. So we have a small releasing program and have always had it. But it has some wild and Arctic char big ones. And we are now putting full force cats and release from that and try to protect that stock as well because it has gone down. Like generally in Iceland, Arctic char fishing has gone down. Uh, Global warming says some because it's an Arctic fish and uh, everything has. And then as, it, as the temperatures get warmer, the, 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 the Arctic char uh, decline. And this is from the small program. It's a little bit special when you have a small releasing um, fish coming back. Often they are at less spots than, than wild fish. It's just typical. I think you must agree with that, Jack. It's, uh, I don't know why. It's, it's just uh, for some reason. You can just see it right away. <coughs> Often they are also a little bit fatter and more. <coughs> or, uh, no, very good, very good. Canada is beautiful, it's big, and crystal clear, but it's so cold. It's one of the coldest. But I have to tell a small story here. This is in the upper part of Canada, so it's as I said, seven, eight kilometers long. And I had a pond in the upper part uh, some couple of years before this photo was taken, just as an experiment. And, my, and, I, and I tagged them, put the octopus in. And uh, late in the season, I decided to look up in the canyon on the high up. It's a little bit of a walk, uh, because yeah. nobody's been fishing. Just to check, I have the time to drop off. I should maybe not say it, but uh, there's a small creek coming in from the right. But I started to catch fish. In this pool, I just went out in the afternoon, just quickly to look. But at the end of the day, it was, uh, it was told in four hours, I went into this pool. It was a fish on every cast. I had not seen a fly all season. Yeah. Every fish was micro, was, uh, at the post was cut and micro tagged from the pond. And in four hours, I hooked 20 and under 12, 46 kilos. <laughs> and I managed to get most of them into the, alive into the small tributary, call, call, call my assistants and uh, some rescue people to come with a tank, and we can use most of them from blue stock. And but they had to stop at 8 o'clock because the tank couldn't take any more. <laughs> And uh, now I'm putting that pond that back in action again, so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for a new opportunity line. And we use the small releasing ponds. This is a small releasing pond. We use them as a, to keep the boot stock as well. Uh, and when we use the catch over the season, uh, more natural, things like a big pool. Like that. Okay, just let me finish. <laughs> Another tributary there, this is famous for Arctic char and the estuary, this is the estuary there, and a small one, but there is a pond as well, I want to put there again, one video. And they want this just to release, and they, they want to go out like crazy, they're panicking. You have to have, have the ponds closed, and you have them closed for maybe one, one, uh, one, uh, it's also next one. Um, see the total chaos, they want to go out, so they get calmed in a few days and they start to take food 
and they get, and then they, you know, they, they, they get slowly multiplicated, and then the fish start to cut, they leave, open, the, open the grill and they go out. And then we go, start to catch them in the pool just below, and you see here, it's just show how good it is. Just before I end, small river on the northwest I have, which is totally different. It's just a natural river, nothing, nothing wrong. It's a natural stock, natural river, and except there is a small stocking program going on there as well. Above this waterfall there, we take some fish in the box, and we move, take some boats, and release some power above. I've done it for 20 years. My prior, uh, the lease holder before did it for 20, 30 years. This year has been stocked above waterfall with power fingerlings for 40, 50 years. And also, there was one beat in that river that was slow, no? and I had a small pond there just to make the, the fish stop in that area. And now you can see the trend line in that river. It used to be like a 200 salmon, now it's an average line, 350 salmon, with a limited stocking program going on in totally natural healthy river. And this is from the pond, this is the first fish of the season, I was catching this fish, and there's a nice lot and everything there. Egg planting, uh, habitat improvement a little bit have been done, like putting out rocks in the areas with the very, uh, which make the power of the ringers come into, this is taking a break or so. Uh, a little bit summary, I cannot go over all of the time, but small releasing ponds increase return rate and control the place of recapture, as I explained, we can control it. Sight of small releasing pond in tributary water or use of main river makes a different place of recapture. But the small quality, the size depends, rearing period, small stocks, stops, all matters. Time of release affects the return rate. I have noticed if I release spots early, they come back earlier as a grills the following year. They are released late out of the ponds, they are coming later as a grills next the following year. Mortality in the river, we try to open the ponds when there is a flood. There is a, they are silvered, they can go out, and we, may, we wait for the next rain or crazy weather, then open the pond and flush them out, maybe. Uh, if, uh, and uh, by stocking, built up rivers with no possibility of natural stock, like Ranko rivers. For rivers, number two, for rivers with limited natural habitat and the run of salmon, like Bretaxo. To get flying start to new rivers and then natural reproduction will take over, like your club. Increase the fishing and control place of recapture in natural rivers with already healthy stock. Look at that already. He said it's too few. Points are safe. Uh, we are waiting for 2024. Season is coming in Iceland starting soon. And thank you.